So in this video, I'll show you some gameplay from my terminal-based block mining simulation game. So the first thing I'll do is mine some of these uh, pieces of wood over here. And you can see over here, here's my coordinates. And I can use the X key to go down in the Y direction. And I happen to know that there's some ore over here. So if you're wondering what those symbols are, these here, the U, that is for uninitialized areas of the map. And over here, these question mark characters, those are just areas of the map that are not currently uh, loaded in memory. So I can just uh, spam the M key and mine my way through to get at some of that ore. So the main one that I'm looking for is iron ore, because I can use that to make a pickaxe. So as you can see, I've added a few different ore types to the game. Most of these were sponsored by people in the last Kickstarter campaign that I did. Alright, now that I've got some wooden blocks and some iron oxide, I can press the C key to craft, so that automatically gives me a piece of iron. And I can press C again, and it consumes all the necessary materials to make my iron pickaxe. So now when I press the M key, I'm mining a lot more at once, so I can use that to conduct my mining activities faster. And so far, that is the entire gameplay loop for this game. Now I can also go back up to the zero level, and I can basically wander all around the map. It's uh, an infinite, procedurally generated world. But the eventual goal will be to add some more ore types, and there's also quite a number of usability issues with the game that I uh, need to iron out first. As you can see, it's quite laggy when uh, initializing new areas. Now it's worth stepping back a bit and asking, uh, why build a terminal-based video game at all? I used to think that building a video game was kind of a crazy thing to do that would never make money, but if you watched some of the videos that I created recently about consulting, I've recently started to think that it's not as crazy as I'd originally imagined, at least compared to the idea of starting a uh, consulting business. I think it follows well from the YouTube audience that I've built with the uh, short series. I wasn't quite sure how those shorts videos would do. I think it took maybe about 50 or 60 of those shorts before it actually started to pick up at all. I think for the first 50 or so I was only getting like uh, less than a thousand views per video. Now I think the idea of building a terminal based game makes sense not only for uh, my audience, but I think it also makes sense from a product development standpoint. I think something that people don't think enough about in business is the idea of if you want to build something grandiose, what is the actual pathway to uh, make it financially viable? And the whole point of building a terminal-based game is that you don't have to build fancy graphics and the uh, upfront development time for building a graphical interface is, is much, much easier. And then eventually if the core mechanics of the game are actually good and they catch on, if the game engine itself is well designed, then you can just stick another user interface on top of it. And as you can see here, the underlying model for this game world is a three-dimensional world. So there's nothing stopping you from building a 3D voxel-based game that just connects to the same game world as this. Instead of using emoji characters for all the blocks, you could have your fancy 4K skins with all kinds of uh, shaders and fancy lightings and stuff like that. Of course, that's a lot of work and it's easy to get carried away, but that's why I think this is a good entry point to uh, get started. When I originally started my consulting business, my whole goal was to uh, use my newfound software engineering knowledge to help companies make money and navigate the world. But as I've described in some of my other videos, it seems like there's really not a lot of market for that in the business world, at least in the small business world. It seems like it's pretty much just the uh, tech giants that actually benefit from any of that stuff. And consumers and small businesses are pretty much cut off from any kind of advanced technology. Now, having said that, especially in the last few years, we've told an entire generation of kids that you have to go get a degree in STEM and learn how to program. So we have a huge market of people, young people who want to uh, learn how to build things, how to write software, how to make video games. And I've noticed in the last few years, it seems like there's an explosion in the world of uh, indie game development. I think there's a ton of young programmers out there who want to learn how to make games, and making games is really just software development. So I was thinking that if I can get any kind of traction with this idea, then I can uh, kind of bake educational topics into the development process of this game. So then I could make money off of uh, basically selling the game, but I can also create educational topics on uh, top of the game. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't really care about making the game fun, but I could just use it as a substrate for uh, any kind of educational topic that I want to cover. Kind of like that last video that I did about terminal-based video game development. The way I presented that video was about game development, but it could have just as easily been about developing other kinds of terminal applications as well. Something else that I think is very important in business is finding ways to do things that will benefit you in more ways than one. And that's why I find myself increasingly drawn to making uh, YouTube videos. The YouTube videos by themselves don't make all that much money, but they do make a little bit of money. And when you think about it, if you compare something like YouTube to, uh, to Facebook, and I have tried out Facebook ads, if you want your ad to perform well, you need an ad that people actually want to watch. So there's a pressure on you to make a, an actually good video for your ad. Now, when you put your ad on Facebook, you have to pay Facebook money to get them to show the ad. But if you make an ad and just upload it to YouTube, YouTube will just show the ad to everyone, and then you make money off the ad. So it's basically the reverse relationship. YouTube basically pays you money to advertise yourself. And I think that's pretty cool. I can basically just sit here and talk about my video game, 
which is an advertisement for my video game, so then everyone will want to play my video game and buy it, so that makes me money. But all the while, YouTube actually pays me to advertise my game, so I'd really like to get back to working on this game. But I have about two more weeks left in my uh, one video per day, and I said that I was going to do that, so I do want to finish it. As of right now, I think the core gameplay loop works pretty reasonably. Unfortunately, the game still is quite laggy, and that's especially apparent when you try to load new chunks. And I was testing this out on another older, slower computer that I have, and I think there's actually some race conditions that I have to fix. So I haven't talked much about the internal mechanics of the game, and my overall vision for the game. So as you can see here, everything is based on coordinates, so it's a 3D procedurally generated world. And currently, these are the only block types in the game, so the entire game world is just a giant matrix of blocks. And I think one of the major flaws in a lot of block-based video games is that the internal representation of blocks is uh, too complicated. So a defining feature of this game is the block data is uh, completely independent of its surroundings. So there's really no such thing as like chunk boundaries or... And the actual data for each block is just raw, untyped binary. So a lot of these right now are just literal emoji characters, but you can also have blocks that are JSON objects, and theoretically, you could just make up your own data type for a block. So you could even use like an XML or an HTML document. Of course, none of that is supported right now. And the ideal model is that clients could connect to this game world and interpret the blocks in any way they see fit. So for example, you could have one client that looks just like this client, but then you could have another client that connects and it actually uh, renders a 3D voxel world from the blocks. And it could be kind of like an ultimate, backward compatible, shared game universe. And to be honest, I would say that I'm less interested in making a video game, and I'm almost thinking about this idea as like a multiplayer database of sorts. I think this would be a fun playground for all the kinds of uh, abstract computational things that interest me. I've thought about calling it something crazy, like a multiplayer recreational programming database. So if I quit the game, and then I connect to my database, and I select the first 10 blocks, so here's an example of the database that is actually powering the blocks in this block world. So it's literally just a uh, SQL table with X, Y, Z, and uh, of course you can have higher dimensions. And at every position in the matrix, there's just a uh, data column. And this can be any binary data. And for the process of decoding the binary block data in the world, so that the blocks can actually have interesting properties, my vision is to have a manifest file that looks like this. And each entry in the manifest file would have some form of information that lets you decode the block and uh, assign a class to it. So this way you could easily add new block types to the game. And if you want, you could have things like catch-all rules. So if you connect to the game world with a client that can't recognize certain types of blocks, you could just have some sort of catch-all rule here. Now I think as the game world gets larger, this may not scale very well, but I think this model is interesting because it's so simple. And when you compare this to the storage model of other video games, most other video games seem ridiculously complicated. And I think with a model like this, it makes it a lot easier to do interesting experiments with the game. And let's say I want to take this block here, that's at this coordinate, and update every block with an exposition of zero. I can just run that directly as a SQL statement. And now if I travel back over to uh, x equals zero, and now you can see that over here at x zero, I've got a stone wall here. And this just extends down to any area in the game world that was generated at the time when I ran that query. So it'll probably stop right here. Yeah. So there's a lot more that I could say, but I'll have to cut it off there for today. If you have any questions or comments, let me know, and I'll try to answer them in the next update video on this game.